The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotgun. They stand behind and you. And fueled by Fioki. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast. Coming in hot with hot. everything you want to hear about sporting clays. Ben Hasway. Each short of wine person would have to fight 14 kangaroos. <laughs> Let's get Anthony on the phone. You're making a big mistake, okay? Yeah. <laughs> We're talking Gianna Santos tonight. Well, I have something, but I don't know how much everyone's going to like it. I was not ready for that. With your hosts, Jason Rambo. You just didn't want my wife to edit something else you did. And Sean Allen. Gotta keep it PG-13, man. Oh. Often imitated, but never duplicated. It's the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. And now, it's showtime. Welcome back, everybody. What's up, Mr. Large and in Charge? Jason, I have been a busy guy. I know you have as well. How's your... Uh, yes. Since getting back to Florida, I'm sure you've been, uh, been well, burning the candle at both ends like I have. Oh, yeah. Project after project. Uh, still unpacking. And, of course, the sporting clay scene is hopping hard and hot and heavy right now. Yep. But you know what? Here we are, back to write the show script and agenda for other po- Clay Target podcasts worldwide. <laughs> so, yeah, I got you, man. I got you. But um, been doing any shooting, Sean Alley? Uh, no, uh, not since the state shoot. Uh, moved last weekend. That was uh, quite the adventure. Um, still going to be unpacking for weeks, maybe months to come. You know how that goes. So. Yeah, you know, this is the first time we've been – in studio since the Ohio State shoot, um, I think it was successful. Uh, not quite as many people as I thought would be there. And I had a conversation with Brandon Powell about that, and he had a really good point. He's like, you know, <laughs> he's like, if you take the Florida swing and then everything that we've led into, he's like, dude, we've been on the road since the last week of January because yeah. not only do they have all the big blast shoots that happen, you know, January, February, March, but then once the regionals and all that started, now you've also had two world championships with the world sporting and the world fee task in our country. So it's just, it's a lot of travel for these guys and are just burnt out, you know? Yeah. So I get it. I just would have thought that with the U S open being the weekend before a lot of those guys traveling through. And again, I know they got homes and families and stuff to go back to. I just thought maybe they would travel through from Chicago to Ohio and then on up to the Northeast or regional, but you know, it, everybody's got their own schedule. So I get it. But no, we yeah. had we had a great turnout. I thought uh, a great time, a uh, good turnout for the the dinners on on both Friday night, Saturday night, the cocktail hour. I thought, uh, God, there had to have been at least what three three or four hundred people that stuck around both nights for those. So that's a pretty good turnout for yeah. a state shoot. Um, I think the I think the show of guns was successful. Uh, the make or break tournament was really good. Yep, that drew a good um, audience. Um, and I think overall yeah. we had like what about five five seventy ish in that range total. Yeah, somewhere shooters. There. So yeah, not quite six hundred, but we're getting there. We're we're knocking closer to the door to six hundred. But um, no, I think it was great. Uh, congratulations, you know, Sean Kemeter, Blaze Whitehead. These guys lit up the scene. Yes, they did. Uh, Brandon's still fighting some gun fitment issues, but I think he was right in there at the top of a lot of the shoots. So, uh, or a lot of the, uh, tournament side games and everything else. So he was, uh, he's still battling gun fit. I talked to him about all that weight loss. And then, you know, that's something that we've talked about before on this show is, you know, I've lost a bunch of weight. I've lost 40 pounds and you know, my gun started smacking me in the face again. I had to do a comb adjustment to even get it close to right, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, no, hey, listen, tonight we're talking to Mr. Steve Ellinger, and this man is like a clay target history buff. And I'm anxious to talk to him. Uh, lots of good stuff I think are going to, think is going to come out of this. I'm excited about his future projects. Uh, he's also working with the NSSA and N- NSCA. Um, so, but Sean, I, I mean, I've got a whole list of questions here. I don't know about you. Yeah. No, I got a bunch. Um, uh- just a little backstory: The NSCA, NSSA is wanting people to, or uh, him and his partner Phil, are going to be taking over the um, the museum and the the history of the sport. So I think it's very exciting. Something yeah. probably that was much needed. And you know what? You got to know where you come from, right? So uh, yeah, hats off to these guys for for accepting the challenge. Absolutely. You know, it's kind of funny because history was my worst subject in school. But then when I got older, I just was fascinated by it. You know, I mean, I, if I ever had time to watch TV, it was usually on the History Channel. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, but yeah. let's face it, you know, <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of difference between a monotone teacher, you know, writing stuff on a chalkboard and having to remember specific dates and names and all that stuff for a test versus, 
you know, watching history, you know, on TV. So, uh, but I think it's fascinating. I've read some of the articles that Steve's had on uh, some of the Facebook groups and stuff, and it's really cool. So I'm anxious to talk to him. Sean Alley, our Dead Pair Blast, uh, first week of December down at Vero Beach is starting to very slowly grow. Yeah, it's getting closer to the date, and we kind of knew that was going to happen. I mean, everybody needs to get through the heat of summer to even start considering going somewhere hot. Um, here up north, a couple more months, and it'll be uh, it'll be definitely prime time to think about going to south. But uh, evenings are getting a little bit cooler. We're starting to lose some of that high humidity. It's been actually pretty pleasant up here in Ohio. I'm sure it's still pretty warm down where you're at. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's kind of funny because it's been cooler here than it has there for a few weeks, and then now we're starting to flip back around again. But yeah, very excited. i um, hoping some of our sponsors – um end up coming down there while you know while we're there at the event so uh, i know they've kicked in some some bonus stuff um for everyone so looking forward to that real quick take a listen to our sponsors and we'll be right back with mr steve ellinger hey guys jason and i really love bringing this podcast to you week after week but it does take a lot of time and a lot of resources to make it happen and without these very special people we couldn't do it on a week by week basis hey toby tom play help these guys remember who they need to support Yes, sir. They can support Fioki USA, Elite Shotguns, Vero Beach Clay Shooting Sports, Score Chaser, Odo Pro Technologies, Rhino Chokes, RE Ranger, Taconic Distillery, and Atlas Trap Company. All right. On the phone with us, very excited about this, Mr. Steve Ellinger. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Well, Steve, we're excited. Uh, we kind of let a little bit out of the cat out of the bag earlier on on our intro here. But basically, long story short, you and your partner, Phil Murray, were asked by the, was it the NSA, NSCA and the NSSA to kind of head up the, the museum and the history of, of our sport? Is that correct? That is correct. I uh, had a meeting with uh, Michael Hampton Jr. And, and some of the other big wigs up there a few weeks ago. And they said, let's do this. And would you and Phil chair it? And of course we said, yes. That is awesome. Well, Steve, tell us, tell us a little bit about your history. Um, how did you get started in this crazy game? And then how did you develop into being such a clay target history buff? Well, I started this probably at about 1989. Of course I was shooting skeet prior to that, but sporting at about 89, not long after it uh, really kind of, you know, made its presence known in the United States and have just spent years uh, shooting sporting clays and, and absolutely loving it. Now, I've always been a history buff, and uh, our local uh, organization here out in Abilene, Texas, Abilene Clay Sports, I published a book uh, back in 19, uh, well, 2008, I think it was, about our 50th anniversary and the history of it. And from there, it has just kind of morphed into my love of the history of the, of the clay target sports. There's not a lot of people doing this. And so I, uh, I approached NSSA and NSCA uh, back earlier in the year and said, uh, let me come to the museum and photograph exhibits and get into the display cases, learn the history of some of this stuff and start writing posts on Facebook and other social media, you know, that are easy to read fast, lots of pictures about interesting things about the sport. And I did that over a, a few months and have been publishing them. And they became very, very popular. And a lot of people that have not been active in this sport in years were reading it and say, I remember that, or I was there that day or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then Phil Murray called me one day and said, let's start a YouTube channel and start filming these little six to eight minute segments on the history of this sport do some interviews and involve people that are Hall of Famers and others that are movers and shakers in the sport. And I said, well, sure, why not? I'm retired now. I have the time to do it. And so we are getting that process underway. Well, how cool. Well, since your partner, Phil, is not with us tonight, can you give us a little backstory on him as far as how do you guys know each other? How did you meet? And why do you think he's a good candidate for this project? Sure. Well, Phil, Phil's got a long history of, uh, clay target shooting he was one of the original californians the famous uh, skeet team back in the 70s and he was the national sales director for beretta for a long time and then became the national sales director for white flyer targets most people probably know him uh from being at the national championships and the world skeet shoot and that sort of thing 
as the White Flyer uh, representative. And he retired from that in a couple of years ago. But I have just known Phil uh, being involved in the sport forever. And he knows every person, every individual, every manufacturer, every sponsor, everything about this particular sport. And so with his contacts and love of history and my love of history, we're putting this together. Gotcha. All right. So let's start with the basic premise. Why do you think the NSSA, NSCA felt this was necessary? I mean, they do have the museum there. We've, Jason and I both visited it and kind of walked through it quickly, but obviously there must be some reason to where they want you guys to go a little bit more in depth and kind of dig under the rocks, so to speak, and find some, some nitty gritty details for people. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of reasons primarily. Um, one, I've been to the national championships, I think, 28 years straight now. And I noticed that when I go, there's very few people actually going into the museum. And how many clay target shooters in the country have ever actually been to the museum? And it's probably a small percentage. And so my rationale of doing the history write-ups was to bring those exhibits to the people uh, instead of them having to come here. And so that's kind of why that started, because nobody that we know of that's out there on YouTube or podcast or otherwise is doing any of this history type of uh, work. In addition to that, the museum is about 85% skeet. Now that's only normal because skeet's been around, you know, for what a hundred years or so. And sporting has only been around since depending on you talk to the mid to late eighties. And so we feel like an expansion of that museum. Now, this is a big undertaking, but I think our committee, which we'll talk about in just a second, if you want, has the horsepower to make that happen. And so we would like to ultimately work towards putting together a sporting clays wing, maybe a theater and some other things as a part of the museum in San Antonio. So when you reached out to Michael, I'm going to I'm probably going to guess he was excited about this project, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the entire staff at NSSA, NSCA, you know, uh, Glenn Mosley uh, was the curator of the museum. And so she was very, very much in favor of this. Nathan Boyd, uh, who's also on the staff out there, was very enthused. So, yes, we see this as a great opportunity for NSSA and NSCA. So we're going to stack actually start this YouTube process uh, during the World Skeet Shoot, and we're going to set up our production stuff inside the museum and we're going to literally interview people there maybe some olympic shooters the national champions uh some of the top ranked shooters administration and then literally get the key and go to the display case and take out somebody's world famous shotgun and talk about it that's Dang. so cool um so are you guys 100 percent self-funded or is the nsca going to help you out a little bit or Right now, we are 100% self-funded, as is the okay. museum in San Antonio. So they rely on donations and things such as this. Now, we are hoping to attract some sponsors. Uh, I think with Phil Murray's knowledge of that industry, he's going to be working at that. So we are going to try to look for some sponsors. None of us are trying to make any money. We just like to care, uh, you know, cover our cost of being in San Antonio and producing these videos. So are you guys going to help? Is there going to be like some new additions to the museum or new things coming in or? Well, we've actually got some new exhibits we've picked up recently. Uh, we've just secured Bob Brister's original shooting vest. We're working on that display. Uh, Andy Duffy, who was on the committee with me, uh, is one of our committee members. He's one of, I think, of only two that have ever won the national championship three times. And I have been able to uh, secure, or it's in the works of securing his shotgun that he won, that he won all three of those with as a part of the exhibit. So we're trying to build up the sporting clay side of that but quite frankly the museum is full so that's the reason we may need to look at a adding a wing onto that museum uh with an emphasis on sporting well i was just getting ready to ask you um are you guys or is the museum looking for items that some of our listeners and, and other shooters would have in their possession to either Abs absolutely we would love to have historical artifacts that trace the history of this uh of this sport uh, one really interesting one that we picked up recently was uh, given to us by uh, Gerald Quinn, who was a the national uh, you know public events you know director for Remington, and literally he found in the trash a 16 millimeter film of the very first 
NSSA World Championship in 1935 in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, wow. Now, that, yeah, exactly. And nobody has watched this uh, in forever, and it's the only known copy of this thing to exist. The problem is we've looked at trying to get it digitized, and the film is very fragile and brittle, and, and not a lot of people want to be able to do that. So we're looking at options. But yes, occasionally we'll have somebody bring us something to the museum that we just can't believe we didn't know about or this existed. And so anybody that has uh, artifacts that are the, the history of this, even if it's, you know, Uncle Bob's skeet shooting vest from 1945 or something like that, we'd like to have it and, and possibly display it. Awesome. That is awesome. Well, let me ask you this. Are there particular items or just anything? I mean, are, are you wanting something significant as far as, I mean, I know you said Uncle Bob's shooting vest, but are you looking for awards? Are you looking for trophies? Are you looking for guns? Are you looking for gear, like old traps? I mean, anything particular? Because our listeners are going to be listening to this. And, and the reason I'm asking you this is that, you know, if we can get the word out, maybe it'll help you guys uh, generate some items for the museum. Yeah, thank you. And that that's a really good question. We, we probably don't need uh, trophies unless it is a very first of a major event, but a, a, a trophy from the 1972, you know, Division C, probably not. Guns are always uh, in desire if we can get those. Uh, one that I'm really trying to get is one of uh, Robert Stack's shotguns. Of course, he was a, a a uh, world champion, Hall of Fame skeet shooter, and that sort of thing. I'm working on that right now, but we would love to have that. But primarily, it's things that would catch the public's eyes. Old skeet shooting vests that have a lot of patches on it, uh, unique clay targets, uh, guns that were used to win awards. Uh, things such as that are always in demand. And are these items considered like – would people like be loaning them or lending them to the museum? Do they need to give them up entirely? Or how do you guys look at it in that way? We we can do it either way. We have items in the museum now that are on loan mm -hmm. from individuals and, uh, or, or some just say, Hey, you know, uh, my husband passed away and he was really involved with this and I don't really want it, but I don't want to just throw it away. We're going to give this to you. So we'll take it any way we can get it. Gotcha. So, Help me understand, Steve, where, where are you coming up with your material? Like you said, you found a film in the trash can, but I mean, is it just internet based? I mean, where is your research? How do you research and find all this history? I mean, the, the, some of the stuff I've read that you've put out is absolutely awesome. I love it. Um, I, I think it's fascinating, but where, where are you coming up with your material at? Either interviews with uh, older Hall of Famers that were there. Or, for instance, uh, there may be a, a shotgun in the display case at the museum in San Antonio, and it may say, belong to Curtis LeMay. Well, I want to go a little further, and who was Curtis LeMay, and what got into shooting? Well, he was probably one of the most notable secretaries of the Air Force in history, uh, required every wing in the Air Force to have a skeet team and division and field. And so I want to dig deeper into what the museum would actually just put on a plaque and then develop that article and then show pictures of Curtis LeMay or whoever it may be with that gun and then have that gun in front of me and let's talk about it. That would be so cool. And speaking of skeet in the Air Force, I'm sure you know the story. I, I don't know if it's World War I. I think it was. Uh, they were training pilots on a skeet field so they would understand how to lead a target. Exactly. Um, that actually came around more in World War II. Okay. Okay. Uh, they would they would use skeet as a uh, initial training method for aerial gunners, and they even took it to the point of mounting on rail cars uh, turrets with shotguns, so they could go out and train aerial gunners on how to lead, and then lead when you're moving, and lead when the target is moving. And, and what's great about that is after the war, then we had all these soldiers coming home and saying, "I want to shoot more skeet." And so as a result of that, in the mid to 40s to late 50s, there were skeet fields popping up all over the United States as a result of soldiers coming home saying, I want to shoot skeet. Wow. That is so awesome. I, please tell me you've got an article coming about that. I do. I, I have so much stuff uh, coming up that uh, it's, I'm, I'm trying to put something up every few weeks. Uh, you don't want to bombard everybody with something, but I have a lot of stuff yeah. coming up and a lot of supporting uh, history 
and photographs and things such as this to include with that. Okay. So, you know, I, I follow you on Facebook and I know you write, uh, some of your articles are up on some of the shotgun groups on Facebook. Now, if somebody's listening to this and they're not, you know, they're not on Facebook or they're not a social media person, where can they go to find your articles and, and read some of this? Well, if they're, that's really the only place I'm having going them right now is on Facebook. But as I said this fall, our intention is to launch a YouTube channel in conjunction with NSSA and NSCA with the Hal DuPont Hall of Fame Museum. And so we're going to be, like I said, filming those uh, segments beginning uh, here in a few weeks uh, and all during the uh, World Ski Shoot and the National Sporting Clays Championships in the museum. So we would welcome anybody to drop by and, and meet us and visit with us and maybe have some input. But right now, uh, the only place we have those being published is on Facebook. Okay. Um, all right. Now, I've been, I've been itching since the very beginning to ask you this question. What has been the most fascinating piece of clay target history that you have uncovered? There has to be something that's just, it puts you in awe. Well, I think it's just the accidental discovery of certain things as the film I was mentioning to you a moment ago. But uh, for instance, if you go in the museum, one of the things, one of the most popular things that people like to see is a old wooden barrel full of white targets from the mid 1930s. And uh, they found them in a, a, a East Texas yard sale. And this whole barrel is full of those targets. That's where that came from? That's where that came from, at a yard sale. Wow. They were white flyer targets. Uh, and I believe, the, if I remember, the invoice was the mid-30s on it. But if you go back and look at some of my articles, you will see a write-up on that. And you will see I posted a picture of an old club from the 30s using those same barrels as a support for tables to put the trophies on at a skeet shoot. Wow. <laughs> Talk and here's history. one sitting there in the museum. People can look at, they can pick up the targets and say, well, I can't believe that has survived all these years. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I, I guess in a sense, uh, the with the sport being so young back then, nobody really ever thought it would come to what it is. And, and they just didn't think about preserving some of that stuff, you know? Well, they didn't. Uh, but here's the deal. If, if we don't preserve it and tell people about our past, they won't know, they won't know about it. Right. In the museum. And this has not been on public display yet, but there is a large scale scrapbook from a skeet shooter named, uh, Dick Shaughnessy. And uh, at 14 years old, Dick won the national championship in skeet at 14 years old and had a distinguished shooting career. He became an aerial gunner in World War II. And just it's just amazing the history that he did. And so shooters today need to know who he was. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Steve, let me bounce back and touch a little bit about the YouTube thing. So are you guys going to be putting out videos on a regular basis once you get that going? Are you doing the filming? Um, can you give us some details about how that's going to work? Sure. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing the filming. Again, we're going to be setting it up in the museum during the uh, world shoot and the national championships as well. Mm -hmm. And Phil and I and a gentleman named Matt Smith, who is a long history in broadcast journalism, he is also a, a very uh, avid sporting clay shooter. And the three of us will be doing uh, those, uh, you know, shows and what we're going to be doing we're going to try to keep them to about six to eight minutes this isn't going to be a broadcast 30 minute television show okay these are six to eight minute videos because we feel like that's probably the amount of time people want to listen to this and do this so we'll be hosting it and doing it and filming it and editing and put it together <laughs> nssa and nsca have been very accommodating in uh, providing us some backdrops and things like that that we're going to be using so it'll have a very uh, special touch we can also take it to locations. And if we know that there is a Hall of Fame shooter that is not mobile anymore uh, because this was, you know, back in the 70s or whatever, we can travel to him and do those particular, uh, uh, you know, filming segments. We can also go to shoots. Uh, again, we're going to be bringing in some of the best shooters in the world to visit with and talk to, uh, hopefully including some of those that uh, participated in the just now completed Paris Olympics. So we're excited about this. Gotcha. Is there a certain schedule, like how often you're going to uh, publish these or just kind of random? 
I'm thinking, you know, you don't want to just bombard one every day, but I think about every couple of weeks, we should probably release another one. Uh, we think we can get a lot of those filmed and put in the can and edited uh, here in a couple of months. And hopefully in, I think in this fall, uh, we'll be able to start putting these things up on the air. That's awesome. So, you, uh, Steve, let me switch gears here for a second. You said you're close to Abilene. Clay yes, Sports? I'm in Abilene, Texas. Abilene Clay Sports. Okay. Well, you'll be seeing my tower here in a couple of weeks. Uh, That's what I understand. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for you guys. Um, in fact, uh, David Radulovich and I are stopping there on the way to the Nationals to see you guys. So, okay, Jim, um, let me know when you're coming in. Yeah, I will for sure. We'll touch base. Um, so I, I'm going to take it. You still shoot, right? You still enjoy the sport, and I'm not as good as I used to be. I used to win a lot of tournaments, but I found that the older I get, the better I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? What's that country song? I'm not as good as I once was. So yeah, exactly, exactly. That's Sean and I's theme song. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow for the uh, New Mexico State shoot. So I'm I'm still actively competing, but uh, you know I think a lot of a lot of people that are involved with this thing with me uh, were former national champions, and they don't really compete as much as they used to. But this lets them stay involved with the sport and brings back a lot of memories, and they can bring a lot to the table about this history. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm excited for you, uh, to do this YouTube channel. I'm, I'm excited to watch it, you know? Um, I really am. And I think this is something that we kind of needed, you know? I mean, I never really thought about it until you start writing articles. It's like, wow, there's really nowhere to dig up the history except for going to the museum. That's um, right. And to, to have this out there in the digital media world, I think is awesome. Um, I think it's needed, you know, I think it's something to remind, especially the youngsters that are coming up and everybody talks about how big the youth shooting is. I think it's important that they know the history and where we came from, and where we're headed, you know, I do too. And I'm, I'm always on YouTube looking at, you know, different sporting and shooting videos, and there's no shortage of gun reviews and club reviews and glasses reviews and ammunition reviews and all this stuff, but there is nothing on there about the history of this sport. And so that's, yeah. we're going to fill that gap and we're just going to bring a lot of it out there. So I, I know you've mentioned a lot of skeet stuff, but are you going to have like different categories for like sporting and skeet? Or are you just going to kind of mix it all in as you go? I think um, we're going to mix it in as we go. We're definitely okay. not doing any sort of a chronological uh, thing because that would just mean, uh, you know, item after item after item that would be exactly almost the same. So we want to mix this thing up. Okay. Gotcha. Make each one interesting. Gotcha. Now, do you foresee having uh, people from the past on, like former champions and that kind of stuff from the from the quote unquote good old days, along with the items and stuff at the museum? Absolutely. Uh, we're gonna, we're, like I said, uh, for instance, uh, Jimmy Prawl, who was a Hall of Famer, uh, is in Oklahoma, and so we're gonna be probably going to him and setting up our video stuff, and we're gonna do some stuff with him. Uh, another key player back in the early days of sporting was Scott Robertson and Andy Duffy. They're both on the committee with me, and I've spoken to them both. And they're going to be bringing up their uh, involvement and, and their memories and so forth, which would be good. Uh, Louise Terry, who is also a Hall of Famer and skeet and active in sporting clays, is on the committee, and she's going to be doing a lot with this also. And then do you also feel like you're going to be doing some coverage about how, you know, the NSSA and the NSCA got started, some of the backstory on all of that as well? Yeah, I think so, because, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me about the history of the complex there in San Antonio. And, you know, it used to be called the Lone Star uh, Sporting Club, I believe it was. And I'm going to be doing a feature on the history of that and how, you know, the NSSA moved from Dallas to uh, San Antonio and how it got merged in with NSCA and all that sort of thing. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people would be, would like to read that and hear that. You know, I, I don't think you'll, you'll have a problem with material. The more I think about it, there's just so many aspects of the sport that you can break down. I mean, the development of, you know, um, traps, for example, everything from handset to now the auto traps and, the development of the shotguns. I mean, I know shotguns been around for eons, but as far as the competition shotguns and how they've developed and everything, I mean, there's every aspect of the sport is you could break it down into a hundred pieces and tell the story of how things have evolved. And this is really, I'm, 
I was telling Sean before we got you on the phone, I history is my worst subject in school. Okay, but a guy standing up in front of the classroom with a monotone voice and writing stuff on a chalkboard and having to remember dates and names was boring. This, as I got older, I found history fascinating. And this, being a sport that we love and we're passionate about, this is awesome. I mean, I, I just, I can't wait for your next article, you know? Well, exactly. And I try to write these things because I also enjoy writing. Uh, to, to put a little bit of human interest into it and, you know, how did the person get started and, you know, put a little hook into it to make you want to read it and finish this thing. But you're right. There are all sorts of avenues in this sport that you can talk about the guns, the targets, the clubs, everything. And yeah, we plan to do all of that. Well, now listen, we can delete this part of the podcast if you, if you don't think this is a good idea, but I'd like to make an offer. And I haven't even talked to Sean about this, Mm -hmm. but you said the only place your articles are being published right now is on social media. What if we made a little link on the dead pair website for history and when you publish your articles we could put them up there yeah i think that would be great I, my goal is just to get this information out there so people can see it and the younger shooters know where we came from yeah i mean it, you know it'd be a way that they could access it without having to dig back through history on social media avenues you know they could go right there and see every one of your articles right and at some point i think that we would like to I guess if you get to a certain point, I think I've released about 20 of them at this point, but uh, at some point, maybe uh, NSSA, NSCA published those things in a uh, coffee table type book. That would yeah, be that awesome. would be really good. Yeah, kind of a yeah. complete compendium. Mm-hmm. I could see that being a good Not seller. In a chronological aspect, in a interest aspect. Right, yeah. right. I think that would be awesome. I think, I mean, I, that. I'm sold. Sign me up. I'll buy one right now. I don't care what it costs. So. <laughs> Heck yeah. Good, good reading materials need at any time, right? Yeah. I want it to be a lot of pictures and very short reading because I want people to read it and look at it. Yeah. Um, Steve, if if anybody wants to reach out to you, maybe they've got some items or maybe they've got a story to tell or some history or something. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Sure. Well, my, let me give you my email first, which is Steve Ellinger, and that's Steve and then E-L-L-I-N-G-E-R, the number 58 at gmail.com. Okay. And my cell number, and I don't mind giving it out because your listeners are, are top notch, is uh, 325-669-7555. And I would be glad to visit with anybody about the history of this stuff because they may have something in their closet that nobody's seen or thought about in years. Yeah. Well, we're, we'll put that, that information in case somebody's driving down the road. We'll put that information right down in the show description of this episode. Please do. Um, so, yeah, anybody can access it any time. Um, Steve, this is I, I'm, I'm super excited for you. I mean, this is really cool. Uh, I think this is needed in our sport. And, uh, I mean, I, Sean, I mean, if we would have stuck with it, maybe we'd be in the history books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we we all we both had uh, life happen uh, after we got involved, and and things go different ways. But yeah, Steve, absolutely. This is something that's I think definitely needed. Uh, hopefully, with this podcast, maybe the the phone will ring, or you'll get some emails. Maybe uncover a few uh, hidden gems that you didn't know were out there. Well, I would like to. I would like to have that museum packed so full of interesting artifacts that people will say have you seen this and they go in there and they look yeah that's that's our goal and, and like i said ultimately we want to add a wing onto that uh museum maybe a little theater like you would normally encounter in some visitor centers and things and really start bringing this thing up that would that'd be so cool and get some more hall of fame inductees and work with that so phil and i've got a really good committee on this hall of fame thing and museum and uh, we're excited to get this thing going. Yeah, how cool. Are you, Okay, now, I know you said you've been going to Nationals for the last 28 years, and I'm, I'm positive you're going to be there this year. Oh, yeah. uh, will you be hanging around the museum if somebody wants to come see you and check out what you're doing? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't okay. exactly know what days I'm shooting on, but, yes, I will be spending probably 85% of my time in that museum uh, filming these uh, uh, segments. And we would welcome anybody to come by and talk to us and meet us and see us and tell stories. Well, Sean, Sean's got it in his schedule. He, he got a kitchen pass. He's going to go to the nationals this year. So I, we will make it a point as long as you're not in the middle of filming, we're definitely going to come in and see you and hang out and 
man, I'd like to see and hear about some of this, some of these materials that you're coming up with. For Definitely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we can, you know, take out the gun into the case and you can hold it and look at it and, and, and say, I can't believe I'm holding the gun that this guy used to do this, you know, and how cool. It's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That is just awesome. That is neat. That is so, that, that is so neat. I mean, yeah. When you can actually see and touch history, I think you just kind of get a good connection with really what happened, you know? I, yeah, for sure. I agree totally. Yep. Well, Steve, um, are we leaving anything out? Is there any more information you want to get out to anybody that we haven't covered? No, I think it's good. I just want to thank the rest of those that are on this committee that uh, Phil and I have been working with and talking to and twisting their arm to say, hey, come on and and do this. And I've had some of them like Scott Robertson say, I didn't know anybody cared about this. Um, Robert Paxton said, well, there's not that many people care, but I really appreciate what you're doing. And what he doesn't realize is there are a lot of people that care and they're contacting me and say, thank you for doing this. We need this. Let's run with it and make it go. Well, I think yeah, as, the, for sure. as the sport continues to grow, I think it becomes more and more valid, right? I mean, it, we're, we're growing, we're, we're gaining new members. I think, I think it's definitely headed in the right direction. So this is definitely going to be needed uh, for, future, oh, for future generations. Absolutely. And I appreciate you guys and the job that you do with the, with the podcast. I know it's always entertaining to listen to and informative and uh, you do a great job with it. Well, Hey, Thank hold you. on a minute. Steve, you're a shooter. Sean, let's do a rapid fire with him real quick. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, do, do it to it, man. Are you okay with that, Steve? Uh, I, I guess. I'm not sure what we're talking about, but let's. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right, we're, gonna, we're just going to ask some questions about your gear. What gun do you shoot? I shoot a Craig off K80. 32-inch barrels? 32-inch barrels, Parkour X. Okay, and those are, remind me, are those chokes or fixed chokes? They are, they're choked with a uh, uh, crack off spin wall. They're choked. And I, I shoot probably 90% of my stuff with the IC and light mod. Okay. Um, is that a custom stock or factory stock? It is a factory stock, but I'm having it restocked as we speak with a custom piece of wood that I, that came from uh, Turkey. Oh, nice. Um, what, uh, what's your favorite shell that you shoot? Well, uh, it's, I tell you what, it, it's hard to beat a good old Winchester double A. What, what recipe do you use? I like really a ounce and an eight, seven and a half. Cause I know they're going to get out there and I, and the recoil doesn't bother me. So I like ounce and an eight. Okay. And you're a seven and a half guy. Um, what glasses do you shoot with? Uh, Pila. Okay. And your hearing protection? Um, uh, usually foam earplugs. Cause that's all I've ever used. Well, I'm telling you what, right now we need to hook you up with the girls over at Odo Pro. They'll they'll fix you right up. I'm I'm telling you, we can do that. It's it makes a big difference. It really does. I I never thought so, but I I, I can't shoot without them now. Okay. Um, okay. Are you a vest or a shell bag guy? I'm a vest, and I use bear pelts pretty much exclusively. Awesome. Okay, one last question, and we're looking for that funny you know lucky rabbit's foot or something is what's in your bag what is something odd that you carry in your shooting bag that people wouldn't expect uh actually it is a disposable raincoat oh there you go that's a good one that's a a good yeah because a great idea i have been in shoots for all the years i've been doing this and it starts raining and i can break it out and put it on and i'm good to go well, I think I think last year at the Nationals we needed a uh, disposable kayak uh, somehow that yes. you could pack in a bag. <laughs> it, 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 absolutely, I, I saw the pictures. People standing in a foot of water. Oh yeah! In fact, I think I saw Noah coming by with animals on the boat. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Steve, this has been awesome, man. I, I've had a lot of fun with this. I'm excited for what you're doing. Um, Heck you know, yeah. any way we can, any way we can help you out, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, even if it's only for a minute, just some information or a question you want to send out to everyone. We're here to help. Um, I, and I just, I, like I said, I'm, I'm excited for what you're doing and I love what you're doing. Well, good. We, we just got to get it done. And I think if we all work together, we're going to make this a great deal. Absolutely. Well, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. And uh, let us know, man. We'd love to throw some of those articles up here on the Dead Pair um, on the Dead Pair website and uh, just have like a whole history tab de- devoted to you and your articles. Yeah, let, let's do it. And because I think uh, I, I want them 
to be fun to read and people enjoy reading it and say, I had no idea. So we're going to do that. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Well, Steve, it's been great, man. We can't wait to see you down there at the Nationals in San Antonio. Uh, Really appreciate your time and really appreciate what you guys are trying to do with this. We think it's definitely a worthwhile endeavor. All right. Well, listen, guys, I really appreciate the opportunity to tell people what we're doing. All righty, man. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Uh, Bye-bye. The Dead Pair. Well, Jason, I tell you what, man, that's that's definitely something new, a new angle, something that uh, hasn't been done. I think it's definitely needed. Our sport isn't that old, like like Steve said. You know, everybody can say mid eighties, late eighties is when everything got started for sporting clays. But obviously, Skeet has a much longer uh, history than that. But you know what? Good for him and good for his partner, uh, uh, Phil, for for taking this on. I think they can do a good job, and I can't wait to see some of the stuff they come out with. I I think it's. I mean. I really do think it's fascinating. You know, back when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have had such a fascination for it. Um, call it, uh, call uh, thinking about the beginning as you near the end because I'm getting so old. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, I, I really do. I think it's fascinating. And uh, I think it, I think these stories need to be told. I mean, you know, what's that saying in a hundred years, nobody, you know, will be alive and nobody will know who you were. Well, this is a chance right. for, you know, history to be there forever, you know, um, I'm sure there probably is some stuff that's a hundred years old. that's in that museum and probably some stories about that kind of stuff. So, um, I don't know. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And I really hope that, uh, this podcast will reach some people that may be holding on to some memorabilia or some photographs or what have you, that might be able to be incorporated in the museum. As Steve said, it's not something that you have to just give away. It can be on loan. You can, you can lend it to them, you know, for posterity or whatever. Um, but you know, don't keep that stuff locked away in a chest or in an attic somewhere, um, get it out to where people can see it. And I think that, uh, I think it'll be a good thing, man. Hopefully it'll, it'll stir up a few people to contact him. Well, Sean, you remember when I was moving mom out of the farm, I found a lot of dad's old, uh, memorabilia, if you will, from the nineties, I'm gonna dig. I, through, I do. I'm gonna dig through some of that stuff. I bet you, bet you, Dad's looking down. He'd get a kick at some, you know, something ended up in the museum. So, yeah, um, absolutely, man. He's yeah. been doing it long enough, and he's the one that got us started. So, I, I think that would be a great idea, Jason. Yeah, seriously, for sure. Um, hey, speaking of history, let's make some history. Uh, the first week of December down at Vero Beach uh, for the Dead Pair Blast. I know I brought it up in the beginning of the show, but uh, you know, I, the more I think about that, this is one of those shoots you better get signed up. Uh, the sooner the better um, because look, we need to make plans for dinner, for cocktails, for everything. So if we can get a head count sooner than later, I think it'd be good. Yeah. And you don't want to miss out on it. That is a beautiful club. If you've never been there, brand new uh, clubhouse that they just got opened up last year prior to our, our inaugural event. And uh, you know, they, they just do it right down there. They have a great facilities, they have great people and uh, they did a fantastic job on the hors d'oeuvres and the cocktail hour. And speaking of which, you know, our sponsor, Taconic Distillery, is going to be down there doing some bourbon tasting and some other stuff. So really looking forward to that as well. Well, you know, Sean, you weren't able to make the last scoop segment we did, but David and uh, Braxton Oliver and I got into a discussion about signature shoots and how much we miss them. You know, I kind of equated it to having a party in your backyard versus going to a big rock concert, you know. And you think about signature shoots, it's that party in the backyard, you know, very intimate. Um, you go to a big regional or U.S. Open, it's kind of like the rock party, you know, rock and roll concert, if you will. Um, yeah. And, you know, you just, these smaller shoots, I think that's part of the reason why we had so much fun last year. And everybody that was there enjoyed it so much. Um, after all the hustle and bustle and, you know, all these guys following the circuit all year long. I think it was refreshing to them just go have some fun and and still make good money. So yeah, and and we were able to mix them. I mean, because everybody else was shooting, we were able to kind of mix in and out of the shooters and go talk to them in between stations. I think people really enjoyed that. You know, just kind of putting some FaceTime with you and me because uh, they they hear our mouths flapping all the time on this podcast. But sometimes it's better to have a face on you know, one face to another conversation. Yeah, for sure. And I really I really did enjoy that part of it. 
Um, speaking of big shoots, though, uh, we're going to have a Nationals preview coming up here soon. I'm going to have Mr. Michael Hampton from the NSCA, as well as Mr. Neil Chadwick joining us. So that ought to be pretty good. I'm um, anxious to hear what they have to say. I know they've made a lot of improvements. Uh, we've joked around about needing a bass boat to go around last year, and I know they've made a lot of strides and efforts to correct some of that with the grounds. Yes. So I'm anxious to hear what they've done. I'm anxious to hear what's new this year. Um, so. That'll be looking forward to that. That'll come up here soon. Um, don't forget, if you've got something for uh, Mr. Steve Ellinger, right down in the podcast show description is his uh, email and phone number. Um, Sean Alley, are you, I know as busy as you've been, you probably in the last month haven't taken someone new shooting, but uh, how are you doing on the old dead pair challenge? Well, I haven't been doing too bad. I've got a host of people that I owe a trip out with. Um uh, like I told you, uh, I sold a young fella my DT-11, so it's got a new home. Told him I'd be taking him out. Now, he's been shooting before, but I definitely want to take him out and go shooting. I've also got about three or four other people that I've promised to get out. But I, it's just been crazy with selling our house, moving to the new house. That all kind of happened during the middle of the yeah. Ohio State shoot, so it was kind of a perfect storm. But I think things will start settling down for me now. We'll start getting things unpacked and getting things situated here in the next couple of weeks, and then hopefully by the end of the month or beginning of September, things will ease back into a normal life, so to speak, yeah. and just go from there. Well, just remember, everyone, take someone new shooting, take them to a tournament. I stole your line, Sean. Sorry. Um, no, it's but I, all right. I think the message is important. Um, we, you know, take them out and show them how much fun we have and why we love this sport so much. Yeah, it's a lot of money, but you know what? Everything you do nowadays is a lot of money. You can't go to the grocery store without spending a lot of money. So who That's cares? You can make more tomorrow, right? So, well, uh, and we've all got our hobbies. I mean, pick and choose. I mean, there's not a sport out there, golf, fishing, hunting. I mean, you name it, you're going to spend money on it. We can't do them all. Nobody can afford to do them all. At least most people can't afford to do them all. And if this is something you're passionate about, I mean, obviously you might as well go full bore on it and just do it to the most, right? Do it to the max. I mean, yeah, there you go. Like I said, you can make more money tomorrow. So who cares? Go have fun. doing That's, it, so. that's right. You just, you just go to work and make more. That's all you got to do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we've got a lot of exciting things coming up. Um, I'm excited for everyone. Um, I, I don't want to drop the ball just yet, but, uh, Good stuff coming. Uh, Sean Alley, uh, any any closing thoughts, my friend? I'm just glad that we kind of made this whole, I don't know, this has been a crazy summer for both you and I. Obviously, I can go into all the backstories about your your medical issues and you <laughs> you you being the walking dead up at the uh, the, uh, the the task World uh, event up in Wisconsin. And, and obviously with me doing my move, you doing your move, it's been a crazy, crazy summer. So again, hopefully things will kind of smooth out. And we'll get back to our regular schedule. And I'm sure our listeners will appreciate that as well. Yep, absolutely. Well, Mr. Alley, it's been fun, but it's time to run. Until next week, my friend. We'll see you all back here on the Dead Pair Podcast. We'll see you next time on the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotguns and Vero Beach Clay Shooting Sports and is fueled by Fioki USA. The Dead Pair theme song was written, arranged, and produced by Toby Tomplay. Big thanks to the following sponsors. RE Ranger, Odo Pro Technologies, Rhino Chokes, Score Chaser, Taconic Distillery, and Atlas Trap Company. 